Uh, we'd like to ask that everybody sow tonight, uh, especially our viewing audience. If you'd like to give, just go to our website at glorifiedchurch.com. And if you've been really blessed and touched by some of these, uh, the videos, we have a YouTube channel. You can go on that and uh, view all of the, the history. But um, it's a, they're, once they're up there, they're there. They stay there. We don't remove them. So, um, But if you're here tonight and you like a credit card slip, please raise your hand. If you need to uh, write a check, write it to GFC or Glory Fire Church. We could uh, really use uh, a help getting through this month. Some of you have been so faithful, and uh, we just appreciate that, and we appreciate you standing with us. Uh, this offering is going to Ken Fish. We didn't really have, we didn't do his offering justice last night at all because it was so late and most of everybody was gone. So uh, he's taken his time to come here. He's very busy. There's a thousand other places he could be. But uh, he comes here out of honor and relationship, I think, and, uh, and a, a deep friendship. So uh, we just uh, encourage you to sow into him tonight, sow into what God's doing through him, uh, actually delivering nations, you know, because he, he's touched uh, many churches and cities in Australia. He goes all over Europe, Canada, United States, and many, many other places, uh, too many to mention, and and actually uh, high offices of government that we can't even mention. So uh, we just uh, encourage you to sow into good soil. Amen. And uh, let's just bless him. Uh, if, if you have cash, you need an envelope, it's on your seat. And anytime you have your offering ready, you can bring it to the front, uh, put it in the treasury box. We thank you for that. For those of you who want to sow online, you can go to glorifierchurch.com and uh, click on the donation button and just earmark it for um, Ken Fish. He's been a blessing over the years, and uh, I know he has a lot more to give. Uh, and, uh, but we also just want him to come here and be able to somehow rest in between sessions. And it seems like he comes in so fast and leaves so fast because he's in demand all over. So it's truly an honor and a privilege to have him. So would you stand as soon as you're ready and just bless him as he comes tonight? And we're, give me a moment. We're going to pray over the offering. Father, we thank you for the seed that is sown. We thank you for every dollar given. Father, we just uh, we lift it up before you. We ask that you breathe on it. Father, would you multiply it supernaturally? Would you cause a supernatural harvest to come in, both in uh, the giver's life and in Ken's life, Father, that he would increase, that you would increase in him, and that there would be an increase in your kingdom all around him, Father, as he goes from nation to nation, state to state, city to city. Father, we ask for miracles to follow, signs, wonders, miracles, as he transforms uh, the human heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that you remove blinders, we remove all hindrances, anything in the atmosphere. Right now, we give heaven glory, we invite heaven to come in, and we give you full reign, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome Ken Fish. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. All right. I got more than I have hands to hold. So give me a second here. Um, I just want to go over a few things from the, the merchandise table. I don't know that we've done the best job uh, with that. I blew in here tonight ahead of the service and had to go make a video, which needed to be ready tomorrow morning. <laughs> So while my worship was going on, I was mostly tied up with that. And uh, because of it, I, I, didn't, I didn't provide to the folks at the table uh, the iPad that we use as a cash register. And um, here's a way you can help me tangibly, aside from the giving thing. 
go out and buy some stuff, and here's why. I mean, the money matters, but the money's not the main thing. My bag came in overweight on one airline where I can get away with that, but I'm going out on an airline where I can't. And so if you, if you were to buy a few things, my weight would come down, and I wouldn't get hit with the surcharge tomorrow morning when I show up at the airport at 4.30. Um, so uh, I'll give you a few things just to kind of whet your appetite and get you salivating, hopefully, like Pavlov's dogs, and that alone will be enough to incentivize you. Um, I've had this out for a little while. This is basic prophetic ministry. A lot of people are really interested in the prophetic. Um, we talked about some of the foibles and pitfalls last night, but the fact remains, in our time, everybody wants to be a prophet. And everyone's looking to figure out how do I get started in that. And there's tons of training out there. But anyway, this is, a, this is my take on how to get started in basics of prophetic ministry. Once you um, have gotten started in those basics, we have uh, this one on, I put them out of order, which of course was wise to do. Prophetic maturation from the life of Samuel. How do you grow up as a prophet once you get started as a prophet? And so there's that one. And now that you are yourself on the prophetic journey, how do you join with a people and become prophetic in community? Because actually the prophetic works best in community. This is why, for example, Samuel the prophet founded the schools of the prophets in the Old Testament. And those schools were still in operation at least at the time of Elijah the prophet. So we're, we're covering from you know, roughly the beginning of the 11, uh, 11th century B.C. up to about the 8th century B.C. And so there's a, there was a long span of time there. And I think they were learning many things. I don't think they were just learning how to prophesy, uh, but that was certainly part of it. And then once you've got a prophetic people, now you need to raise an entire generation. So those are kind of four different levels of development and maturation in the prophetic grace. And then um, this is a relatively newer one on receiving and giving words from God. How do you actually get a word from God? Some people have struggled with that. And uh, I mean, some of what we were talking about last night is even people who are well known as prophets can make mistakes in this area. So this is how you receive and give them. Um, I think I'm going to have an avalanche of discs here in a moment. And then this is a newer one, the process of prophetic revelation, the actual unpacking of how that works. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of this material tonight, not all of it, but if you want to hear more of it, I think I have two copies of it out there. So perhaps all that will draw your attention. And then, oh, wait a minute, no. Yeah, thanks. And then um, these are a couple of other ones that are a bit newer that don't have anything to do with the prophetic particularly, but they have everything to do with revival and outpouring. And everybody tells me everywhere I go, you know, we're going for revival. And I'm like, well, that's interesting because I've got a ton of titles that I always bring with me that deal with revival and awakening and outpouring. And they're always my worst selling titles. I mean, literally, I sell fewer of these than anything else. And so I don't think that they're worse teaching. I mean, yeah, I try to you know, give it my all every time I speak, uh, but they just don't sell. And so with that, I often wonder, do people really mean it when they say they're all about revival and awakening? So anyway, the question hangs in the air. Um, so this one is on awakenings, and it deals with the anatomy of an awakening, how do they unfold, and it also deals with Josiah's awakening, which is a particularly interesting awakening because Josiah was... Uh, the last righteous king of Judah. He also was the most righteous king of Judah. But as I mentioned last night, <clears throat> 19 years after his death, the, Judah was wiped out by the Babylonians. And so Josiah had a great revival right before the end. But there were some problems with that revival, and I you know, explore what those are. And I also talk about what are some of the key components that you might see. I will warn you that that Josiah message if you're listening to a lot of the modern commentary that's out there about topics that are inflaming our country, you might find that some of it's a little bit unsettling because it very much cuts against the grain of modern thinking about a lot of these topics. Um, this is one I did in Australia right before the world came to an end. I mean, COVID hit. 
and uh, this is called Maranatha. Maranatha is the last book, uh, last word in the Bible. Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. It's from the book of Revelation, but it's on the second coming of the Lord. And uh, which, by the way, is interesting to me. Uh, you know, we, we keep talking about renewal and awakening and revival and all these kinds of words. Um, the thing that interests me about that is actually revival is not the goal. The coming of Christ is the goal. And if you were listening to most of what's being put out in the blogosphere, online, YouTube, whatever people are using, Facebook Live, I don't hear a lot of talk about the coming of Christ. I hear a lot of talk about revival. And so I've often said, only half kiddingly, that revival has become the golden calf of the modern American church. And we dance around it and say, these are your gods, O Israel, who have delivered you out of Egypt. Well, so we really need to get our focus on the second coming of Jesus. Uh, but we do want revival to presage that. And so with that, I went to Iowa last summer in the middle of COVID and preached a genuine old-fashioned tent revival. And we called it Fire on the Prairie. Actually, they called it Fire on the Prairie. I don't know if I would have had the nerve to call it that, but they did, and so it stuck. Anyway, if you want to hear those recordings from Fire on the Prairie, there it is. Um, the only thing I didn't have was the old-fashioned style biplane that I could fly in uh, and become a barnstormer. That's how the revivalists in the 1940s and 50s, when that healing revival was going on around the country, uh, that's how they traveled because the roads weren't that good at that time until you're better in a, in a small propeller plane. And this is totally off script, has nothing to do with anything tonight, it's just a fun story, but uh, my aunt died a couple of years ago and she was absolutely not a believer. Um, I'm not sure that I'm going to see her in heaven. I attempted to lead her to the Lord before her death and um, at one point I was doing this and she was like within hours of death and she opened her eyes, she couldn't speak, and she looked at me with this death gaze. So I, I don't know if that meant I believe and I receive or <laughs> go to, <laughs> I don't know which one it was. But anyway, uh, before she got into that state, we had a, a conversation one day about what life was like in the 1950s in America. And she was telling me about these guys that they used to watch on television and uh, she said most of it seemed to occur out in the Midwest somewhere. And, of course, no one went out there in those days unless they were driving to California. But she said um, the thing that was amazing was they were all talking about healing and miracles. And she said, and to watch it on TV, it looked for all the world like these people were being healed. I don't know how they got all those people to be shills. And I said, well, I don't actually think there were shills. I know people who knew those people, and I think there was a lot of legitimate healing. And she said, Really? She goes, wow, well, it sure looked genuine. And I said, yeah, well, that's because it probably was genuine. I mean, I can't vouch for every single one. But anyway, you know, that sort of thing made an impact even on my atheistic, hardened, embittered aunt. And so I really want to kind of put it in front of you that the recovery of an authentic signs and wonders ministry, not the kind of, I don't know, the stuff that can't really be verified and doesn't stick and stand the test of time. That's not the one we're talking about, but the one that's really got legitimacy to it, it will cause even the non-believer to ponder these things. Because here it was in the year 2018, and it was, whatever that is, years after the 1950s, uh, maybe around 60 years later, and my aunt was still talking about it. Just think about that. Well, one of the dimensions of the miraculous and the supernatural that we need to recover and do better with is the prophetic. And, of course, I kind of gave you my take based on a visitation <clears throat> of how we missed it so badly with the election uh, when I was speaking last night. And tonight I want to talk about how to unpack the process of prophetic revelation because um, the scripture says that it is itself supposed to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And with that, the reformers uh, said that the Bible is our sole rule of faith and practice, not just what we believe, but how we do what we do in the realm of faith. And one of the things that I'm 
starting to talk about, which I'm not really going to talk about tonight, maybe next time I come, but I'm starting to talk about um, the new Reformation because I really believe we need one. We had a big one 500 years ago. Martin Luther uh, famously pasted, po posted, not pasted, his uh, 95 theses or objections, complaints, against the Catholic Church on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And of course, for this, he was you know, sentenced to death, and he was uh, hidden so that the authorities were not able to burn him at the stake. But uh, anyway, he kicked off the Reformation, and really, most of the Christianity that people in this room would be in any way involved with today is probably a derivative somehow downrange of what Martin Luther did half a millennium ago. Because all of these churches are Protestant churches. They don't have their allegiance sworn to the Pope. They have a different understanding of the way the sacraments work from what the Catholics believe. Uh, they don't necessarily believe you must have apostolic succession. There's a whole series of things where the Protestants and the Catholics understand things differently. Um, I think both are Christian churches and both have their own warts and bumps. And as time goes by, I see uh, both more clearly maybe than I did when I was younger. But if we understand this, this creed of the reformers that the Bible is to be our sole rule of faith and practice, then that tells me that if we're going to learn about the prophetic, then the best way to learn about the prophetic, aside from maybe knowing a few prophets, is to look at how did it work in the Bible. And I think God put things in the Bible that would specifically show us how these things work if we pay attention. But, you know, a lot of times we don't really know what we're looking at. Other times maybe teachers don't highlight these things. And another problem that continues in our time is that ever since the days of Martin Luther, 500 years ago, for the most part, the Bible is taught dogmatically. Here's the doctrine, here's the scripture that undergirds it, and so this is why we believe it, and there you go. But there's not as much emphasis on praxis, how to live it, how to do it. And so I think one of the key tenets of the new Reformation is going to be to teach the Bible, I'll say dynamically as opposed to dogmatically. And when I say dynamically, what I mean is we understand the dynamics of the spiritual life, what it means to be in relationship with God, how to interact with him in such a way that the things that are viewed in the Bible that we see actually can be brought forward into the now and they become part of our experience too and we don't just have to sit there and go, wow, it must have been really cool to be Elijah. Too bad I wasn't alive 2,800 years ago and I missed the show, right? So with that, I want to uh, talk about uh, deconstructing the prophetic. Now today, the term deconstructing, a lot of times that term is used to mean we're going to take it apart with the objective of tearing it down. I don't want to tear it down. I want to I look at the building blocks and then I want to put it all back together and use it in a in a synthetic manner, not synthetic like fake, but where we've created synthesis. And so uh, to do that, we're going to look at um, a couple of examples from the Bible of uh, two very well-known prophets receiving their revelation. How does this work so we can hopefully begin functioning in a, in a like manner? So if you've got a Bible, and I hope you do, uh, open it to Isaiah chapter 21. <clears throat> And I'll just start reading here. We're in verse 1, and this says, The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. Now, we don't know exactly where the wilderness of the sea was. Um, there were a couple of seas that they commonly referred to in the Bible. One was, of course, the Red Sea, which they crossed when they came out of Egypt. And then, of course, we have the Mediterranean Sea, which is sometimes called the Great Sea or the Western Sea. Um, but this is an oracle concerning the wilderness associated with the sea. And an oracle is a, uh, is a word that is spoken. It is a declarative, prophetic word. And so 
this is, this is how Isaiah got this word. Now, this is not the same thing as saying that every oracle has to come this way or that this is even the only way to receive an oracle. It is simply to tell you that in this particular oracle, this is how he got it. And so it goes this way. As whirlwinds in the Negev sweep on, it comes from the wilderness, from a terrible land. A stern vision is told to me. The traitor betrays and the destroyer destroys. Go up, O Elam, lay siege, O Media. All the sighing she has caused, I bring to an end. Therefore, my loins are filled with anguish. Pangs have seized me. Like pangs of a woman in labor, I am bowed down so that I cannot hear. I am dismayed so that I cannot see. My heart staggers. Horror has appalled me. The twilight I long for has been turned for me into trembling. Um, and then he goes on. All right. Well, you might read this and go, well, that, that sounds interesting. What does that mean? Sounds sort of poetic, possibly, but, uh, you know, unless I go get a Bible commentary and read it, uh, I don't really know what to do with this. So let's try to unpack this a little bit. Isaiah is describing a threefold reception of Revelation, a threefold reception of Revelation. He says it's an oracle, and I've already told you that's a spoken, declarative, prophetic word. Generally speaking, oracles are given uh, to groups, but sometimes they're given individually to people. Generally given to groups, sometimes individually to people. You know that only if you read enough of the prophetic literature in the Bible to become familiar with some of these terms. Um, so, you know, think of it as something that, uh, like a town crier would say, or something like that. And in this case, Isaiah is getting it through sensory perception. You know, a lot of times when we when we talk about our renewal churches, one of the things that I I I really am I'm kind of like a dog with a bone on this thing is I go to a lot of renewal stream churches, and at least tonight we had some sung oracular prophecy. Rhonda was doing most of it, I think, maybe someone else too. But anyway, by the time I got in here, Rhonda was the main one that I heard. Um, but most churches I go to, there's very little prophecy going on at all. And there should be a lot of prophecy because Paul says, of all the spiritual gifts, he says, you can all prophesy. He says, all of you should desire spiritual gifts and especially that you would prophesy in order that the church would be built up or edified. So there's a unique uh, building process that comes about through prophecy. And <clears throat> when prophecy comes, uh, there's a benefit to it. I mean, it has to be administered well, but there's a benefit to it. And yet, much of the time in churches I go to, even supposedly switched on, on fire, going for, the, going for God, we want revival and the golden calf type churches. Nobody got the joke. Uh, in all of that, I don't hear a lot of prophesying going on. The only prophesying I tend to hear is if, you know, the big name prophet is on the platform giving words. And other than that, I don't hear these kinds of oracular prophecies. Someone might walk up to Rhonda or David or Jim and say, you know, here, I've got a word for you. And I'm not trying to call into question the validity of that. I'm just saying that kind of one-to-one -one prophecy, while also biblical, isn't what we're talking about. This isn't the item. This thing of oracle is something we have to recover because it's been lost. And part of a reformation is we have to recover things that have been that have been done away or allowed to erode. And so Isaiah is talking about this oracle that he has concerning the wilderness of the sea, and he says, it came to me like whirlwinds in the Negev. Well, what is the Negev? It's the southern part of Israel. It's the area below Beersheba, all the way down to the Red Sea. And in that part of the world, it's kind of dry, arid country. And out west, you know, where I live, when you drive through those kinds of places, Utah, Nevada, California, Eastern California, Arizona, and places like that, we call them dust devils. You see these, you know, rising towers of um, dust. Sometimes there's a bit of debris, maybe tumbleweeds in it. But that's what Isaiah says. It came 
as a whirlwind sweeping in the Negev, but this one came from the wilderness from a terrible land. And so as Isaiah is seeing this, I don't know where he saw it. Did he see it in a vision or did he see it on a mountaintop or from a tower? I don't know, but somehow he saw something and he says it came from a terrible land. Well, if you look west from Jerusalem, which Isaiah kind of hung around in that area, if you look west from Jerusalem, you're going to see west to the Mediterranean. You're looking out over Jewish territory for the most part, unless it happens to be overrun by Philistines or Egyptian armies or something at any given locus in time. And so what he's really doing is he's saying, I cast my eyes to the east, and as I looked to the east, I saw something like a whirlwind coming. And it came from, he says, a terrible land. Well, terrible, there's only one way to understand terrible. So this is not the good place. This is the bad place. And he's specifically giving a word concerning Babylon. And you might remember that there was a story that happens in Isaiah, or maybe you don't, so I'll fill you in if you don't. But um, at one point, Hezekiah becomes ill. It's a little later in the book. But at one point, Hezekiah becomes ill. He has a boil. And the word of the Lord comes to Isaiah, and he says, go tell Hezekiah to set his house in order. He is about to die. So Isaiah walks in and says, thus saith the Lord, you shall die and not live. Set your house in order. So much for good words all the time. And so Hezekiah turns his face to the wall, and he weeps, and he says, oh God, remember how I have served you from my youth. And so before Isaiah has left the palace, it says before he'd left the, the middle court, it's probably a pretty big home. I don't think this was your typical, you know, 2,000-foot tract home that Hezekiah was living in. But before he's gotten, you know, halfway out the door, the word of the Lord comes again to Isaiah saying, go back and tell Hezekiah, you will live and not die. I will add 15 years to your life. And then Isaiah says, make a poultice of fig leaves, put it on the boil, and he will recover. So there's some kind of a divine healing that comes out of all that. All that by the word of the Lord. Do you think we could use a little more of that? So after that all happens, Hezekiah gets up out of his sickbed and eventually some envoys come to him from Babylon, diplomats. And they come to congratulate him on his recovery. And while they are there, Hezekiah takes them and shows them all the treasuries in the temple and all the riches that he himself has built up. And after they've gone, Hezekiah, Isaiah once again comes to King Hezekiah. And he says, who are those men? And he says, oh, they were envoys from Babylon. And he says, and what did you show them? And the king says, well, I showed them everything. And he said, you did foolishly, because now all that is here will go there. Now, just to be clear, Isaiah is speaking of a time 150 years in the future. But he's still prophesying with accuracy of what will occur. And so it's kind of with that in mind that Babylon is a rising power. At this time, the main threat in the world is a nation called Assyria. But Babylon is a rising power. It would be akin to saying maybe in 1940 or 41, or 2, or 3, or 4, or 5, or 1950, although maybe by then it's a little too late, uh, it would be akin to saying, we're facing down Japan, uh, but there's going to come a day when a rising power called China will, will overshadow you, and all that you have will be taken by China. That is a little more pungency, doesn't it? And so it's that kind of a thing. They're still dealing with Assyria... In fact, Assyria will attack Jerusalem during the reign of Hezekiah and very nearly take it, but it, but it doesn't do so. In fact, because Isaiah gives a word and he says, the waters will come up to your neck, but it will not overtake you and the tide will recede. And as it does, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head and mocks in derision as the armies of Assyria flee. But... Babylon, that'll be a different story. That'll be a different story. <clears throat> so with that understanding and all that historical context, Isaiah gives this word. 
it comes like whirlwinds out of the Negev. They sweep on from the wilderness from a terrible land. Well, whirlwinds are never a good news. They, they you know, strip the leaves off of things. They often bring clouds of locusts. And so he's talking about the way Babylon comes, the way it, the way it invades a land, the way it, the way it overpowers and strips everything from it. And then he says, a stern vision is told to me. Oh, this oracle is obviously a vision. Now, it might have also been something that he perceived in the natural. He might have literally seen a whirlwind as he looked out to the east, but he sees a vision, and it's not a happy God vision. It's a stern vision. Now, I'm not all about gloom and doom. I'm just calling out what's in the text because we do need to have a bit of, a, of an adjustment in all this happy God prophesying that's been going on for the last 30 years because it, it's, it's, it's too much to the other side. Yes, God loves us. Yes, he wants to bless us. Yes, he's on our side. I know a lot of people needed to hear some of that kind of teaching and had been beaten down with heavy-handed teaching of another kind from another era. But we can't just leave it at, you know, God never says anything that's stern. So he says, a stern vision is told to me. And with that, he tells us that there's two channels of reception right here. One is the visual. He had a vision. And the other is, it is told to me, which means his ear is opened. He's hearing something. We don't know if it's audible. We don't know if it's internal hearing. But one way or the other, he's hearing it. He says, the traitor betrays and the destroyer be- destroys. Go up, Elam, lay siege, O Media. Well, that wouldn't mean anything to most people, but uh, Elam and Media were two of the primary cities of the Middle East of that era. And if you know anything about biblical history, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. Well, there's the word Media. That's where they get the word Medes from And when we talk about Elam, it's another major city. So what would be a comparable type uh, thing to say here? Well, Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States, and maybe you could pick another major city nearby, Philadelphia or New York or something. It's still a very important city. So what he's saying is these two cities will summon their armies. They will come up against Babylon. And all the sighing that she has caused, I will bring to an end. Because Babylon was notoriously vicious in what they did to those whom they conquered. They did it to the Jews. Uh, Much of the book of Obadiah addresses the cruelty that the Babylonians meted out upon the Jews when they conquered them. Jeremiah speaks of some of this in the latter part of his book, as well as in the book of Lamentations. Um, but, But Isaiah, again, is speaking 150 years before. And so this is, this is really good quality long-distance prophesying, but you might not have even known it. And he says, therefore, my loins are filled with anguish. Now, he's already said, I saw something and I heard something. And, and the vision part, that one's fairly clear to me, that, that you know, visions generally are internal. By the way, one of the reasons we know visions are generally internal is because when Saul is struck blind on the Damascus road in Acts chapter 9, when Ananias of Damascus is told to go pray for him and heal him in order that he would receive his sight, he's blinded. But the Lord says to Ananias, go find a man named Saul on Straight Street. He is praying for he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and lay hands on him that he would receive his sight. Well, if vision is always external, How does a blind man see a vision? So most visions will be internal, and for most people who get them, they occur right here in kind of the front part of of the forehead area. Now, depending on you, you might have a different experience. You know, your results could differ. Um, You might see a vision back here with your eyes closed or up here or whatever, but at least with regard to to Saul, who became Paul, we understand that he was having a vision as a blind man, and therefore you don't necessarily need eyeballs in order to have a vision. 
So Isaiah's vision is of a whirlwind. Again, it may have been triggered by a physical phenomenon of a literal whirlwind or not. We don't know. Then he has this auditory experience. Again, whether it's literally audible or it's internal hearing, we don't know. But he has something going on there. And then uh, the third part of it is my loins are filled up with anguish. Well, what are the loins? Well, loins is a term that refers to kind of, you know, roughly from here about the knee up to the waist. And you know, it tends to refer to the inner part of the thigh and to the reproductive organs. That's really what the loins are. And so Isaiah is saying, not only did I see, not only did I hear, but I had a sensation come over me right here, kind of in my midsection. And he says, pangs have seized me. Well, again, this my loins filled with anguish is a feeling description, and pangs is a feeling description. And Pangs, that word specifically refers to that which a woman experiences when she goes into contractions if she doesn't have Pitocin, or not Pitocin, the other one. That, what's the one? That they, the block that everyone gets. Yeah, an epidural, but there's a specific drug they use. Anyway, what is it? Oxytocin, yeah. Pitocin makes you go into labor, yeah. I used to know this stuff cold when we were still having kids. Okay, so what Isaiah is saying is I'm seeing something and I'm hearing something and all of a sudden, ah! it hit me like a woman having a contraction. That makes it really pungent, doesn't it? This isn't, I think I might have, could have possibly seen a vision, maybe I hope. So pangs have seized me like the pangs of a woman in labor, and I am bowed down. <gasps> and when that hits me, I cannot hear. That which I was receiving in an auditory fashion is shut down, and I am dismayed so that I cannot see. The hearing and the seeing are overridden by the physical sensation of what is coming on me. Isaiah is describing how he got his vision. How he got this word. You still want to be a prophet. Okay, and then he says, not only that, my heart staggers. It, it skips a beat. I'm having heart arrhythmia. And horror has appalled me. I'm aghast. Oh, 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 oh. The twilight I longed for has been turned for me into trembling. So these are the ways that Isaiah got this word that's going to deal with the ending of Babylon and its reign long before Babylon was even a thing, really. I mean, they were a rising power. They had their own kind of center of gravity. But at that point in time, they were no match for Assyria. They had not taken their place on the world stage as the preeminent power. And he's already speaking of the end of Babylon. So he's prophesying beyond the rise. And when we, when we see this unfolding in front of us, we understand that there are other places in Scripture that address the various aspects of Revelation. In Psalm 24, verse 3, it says this, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And that is a psalm that has a very specific purpose, but I think, you know, Scripture often has multiple layers of meaning to it. And so when we talk about lifting up your heads, O gates, I want to suggest to you that lifting up your head is part of lifting up or opening the gates of Revelation. And there are actually six gates of Revelation. Six gates of Revelation. Six gates of Revelation. One is the eyes. We saw that with Isaiah. Another is the ears. We saw that one with Isaiah. A third one is the sense of touch, which in his case is coming right in here is like a you know cramping thing that bends him over. But then we have the sense of smell, the sense of taste, and interior knowledge. Six different ways that revelation can come to somebody who is uh, operating in prophetic dimensions. And so when we talk about lifting up uh, our heads, O oh, gates, what we're really talking about is opening the gateways of revelation. And one of the best ways to open the gateways of Revelation is to make sure they are not clogged with junk. 
And so with that, I would just cross-reference to uh, Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Well, the heart is itself an important part of the revelatory process because if our hearts are embittered, if our hearts are angry, oftentimes we either won't hear at all or if we do, our words will go off course. Bob Jones used to teach on this. Uh, he men I mentioned him with his teaching on stinking thinking last night, but another one that he used to talk about was, you know, if you have anger in your heart or you're not filled with love, your words will tend to go off. And so with that, just let's do stop and do a process check. Do you have bitterness or anger toward anyone in your heart? Do you have unfinished business? Do you have unconfessed sin? Because if you do, the gateways of revelation are clogged already and you need to lift up your gates so the king of glory can come in. And so there's a lot of people that are trying to dabble in the gifts, but they, they aren't doing the work that needs to go ahead of that in order to be sure that these things all work. So keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it f uh, flow the springs of life. Well, I might say keep your eyes with all vigilance. Stay away from pornography. Stop looking at the lurid Salvador Ferragamo billboards or the whoever, Calvin Klein billboards, whether with men or women in their underwear or the... I mean, some of those billboards look like orgies are going on, and it's multiple partners of multiple genders doing whatever they're doing. But, you know, guard your eyes. Don't look at stuff that you shouldn't. You know, there's absolutely nothing you need to look at in this world that's in the realm of advertising or sports or anything that you, that you must look at. You could get by without it. Now, you do need your eyes. I'm not saying it's okay to be blind. You need your eyes to cook. You need your eyes to enjoy the beauty of God's creation, to you know, take care of your children. I mean, there's a lot of reasons you need to see. But guard what your eyes look at. You know, we don't talk about this enough, and, and it's to our detriment. And sometimes we don't do it because, well, we don't want to be legalists, you see. But with it, we give place to licentiousness. So guard the gateway of the eyes. Guard the gateway of the ears. What do you listen to? I mean, I remember one time uh, my wife and I were walking down the Santa Monica Mall in Santa Monica, California, and we walked by this music store, and the Santa Monica Mall is an open-air mall. It's about two blocks from the ocean, and, you know, people like to go down there and stroll and shop and eat ice cream and, you know, do what you do when you're doing something like that. And we walked by this one music shop, and I wish I could get the lyrics of this song out of my mind. I won't repeat them here. They're not fit for uh, public utterance, but... But we walked by, and this kind of real gnarly, raspy <laughs> started to come out of the store because they just put on this song. And the words, I could not believe my ears. It, it, it literally assaulted me. And this kind of thing is being you know, uh, cast through the world in all kinds of places. Unless you think I'm going to start by you know, pointing fingers at those rebellious young upstarts of the current generation... Um, I would actually direct most of us looking at the age in this room to the music we listened to when we were young and, you know, so-called so classic rock was on the rise. Let's spend the night together. Now I need you more than ever. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. And things like that. And this stuff all just sort of came into our heads. And, you know, to this very day, if you hear that song come on the radio, you're like, yeah, and you know, you're rocking out and singing to it. And it's like, wait a minute, why am I singing this? What is that anyway? And so for a lot of us, it's almost like we had our gateways, well, open to the wrong thing and blocked open or shut down and locked shut years ago. But then, you know, you can think about some of the th song lyrics that are in some of the modern music. I have a particular distaste for rap. Not because I'm a racist, I just don't happen to like rap meter, rhythm. I don't like the lack of musicality, and I don't like a lot of the lyrics. So guard the gateways. We've talked about eyes and ears. <clears throat> touch. A lot of times we become very enamored with, um, I would say, sensual touch. And by that I don't mean sexual touch, although it could include that. Uh, sometimes it's just fine fabrics and things. And then smells and tastes. You know, we, we, we are a people who are addicted uh, to the realm of the physical, and so we, we please ourselves with all kinds of scents and smells and, and tastes that are designed to please our, our senses, our flesh. Um, 
but you know, with that, a lot of times when I talk with people and I'll say, do you smell that? And they say, I don't smell anything. I said, there's a smell here. It's the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's a smell in the spirit. I don't smell that. And you know why? Because their gateways are blocked. It's a real thing. A lot of times when I'm ministering to people, whether in healing or deliverance, I can run my hand over their back and I can feel things on their back. Heather, you've seen me do some of that. And people are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, there's something right here. And how do you know that? It's like, well, because I can feel it with my sense of touch. My gateways are open. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. But if all you've ever known is satin and ermine and, you know, whatever, well, maybe your senses have been dulled and blocked. Does this make sense? I'm trying to help you come into the realm of how this revelatory thing works. So protect the gates. There's six of them. I named them. And then keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the wellsprings of life. And don't forget this one, the pure in heart will see God, Matthew 6, 8. And so there's, there's a real value to be placed in having a pure heart and pure motives. And again, I don't think this is being stressed nearly enough in our time. And then <clears throat> we talked a little bit about this one earlier, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but in Matthew 16, 13 to 20, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And there's multiple opinions. Well, opinion can hinder revelation. Again, I addressed it last night, so I'm not going to go much further with it, uh, except to say that opinion can hinder revelation, and so this is yet another gateway to revelation. And then there are uh, there is higher revelation that can follow an initial revelation, but if we shut down the initial revelation or we never get it when it comes in, we will miss the higher revelation because immediately on the heels of who do men say that I am, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says, blessed are you, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. And then what does he say? Let me tell you a deeper revelation. The son of man is going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. He's going to be killed. He's going to be betrayed. That's a higher revelation. And what does Peter do? He rejects that revelation. Why does he reject that? Well, because he's switched out of that revelatory dimension that I mentioned last night. And in switching out of it, he actually misses the higher revelation that the Lord meant to give. And so with this, there is a, there is a well, we see it in the book of Revelation when John uh, on Patmos, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. He hears a sound behind him and he turns and looks and it's the Lord Jesus he gets the dictation of the seven letters. He apparently jots all that down as he was meant to. And then it says, after this, after what? After I'd followed through faithfully all seven letters, after I had acknowledged the risen one that came to me on Patmos, it was after all that that I heard a voice saying, come up here, and I saw a door standing open in heaven. The higher revelation follows the lower revelation, because he who is faithful in little will be given more. Does that make sense? So this is how we grow in the prophetic. But we've got to be faithful in what we're given, and we have to collaborate with God in these matters, even when it offends the mind. Well, all of that we pulled out of Isaiah and how he got a prophetic word. Now let's go to the New Testament and let's look at another famous prophet. His name is Jesus. And I want to unpack how Jesus the prophet... You know, I've been looking at this subject now for about two years, and I'm, I'm getting ready to write a new conference on um, Jesus as prophet. Because even though we say he's prophet, priest, and king, I don't hear that much teaching on Jesus as prophet. And, and I mean, he's like a prophesying fool. It's, it's, a, it's a really critical part of his ministry. He's doing it everywhere he goes. He calls his Achaeus out of a tree. You know, he, he gives Peter a prophetic name. You're no longer going to be Simon. You're going to be Peter. Um, you know, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I mean, there's so many dimensions of Jesus as a prophet that it, it's worthy of its own study. But I just want to look at one specific prophetic encounter. We're going to go to John chapter 1. We're in verse 43. Now, Jesus has called his disciples, and <clears throat> speaking of prophecy, verse 42, 
he, uh, he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, this is Andrew bringing his brother Simon, and he says, you are Simon, the son of John, and you shall be called Kepha. What's he doing? He's giving him a prophetic name. He's renaming him. You were Abram, now you'll be Abraham. You were Yaakov, now you will be Israel. This is how prophetic naming goes. Jesus does the exact same thing to Peter and renames him. Kepha, which is the Greek form of that name. All right, so the day after all this goes down, so we've now got uh, James and John and Andrew and Peter who have been called. After that's all happened, it says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, which is in the north, it's where they're going to. And so Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, namely Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now, I think here what's happening is Jesus is operating in discerning of spirits. He's seeing that Nathanael is a man with a true heart. There's nothing demonic going on in him. There's no human ambition either. Um, the, the King James Version says, in whom there is no guile. There's no trickery. There's no, nothing slippery about him. And so Nathanael says to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. There's Jesus the prophet again. You weren't even here, but I saw you in a vision. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Well, he's prophesying to him. Nathanael, you're going to see greater things than what I saw. Does that sound like something else in the book of John? Greater works shall you do. Well, greater things shall you see. So now we're talking about two different dimensions, power and prophecy, or power in the prophetic, or power in revelation. So there's a, there's a dual promise in now that. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Again, a prophetic word given to Nathanael about what he will see, what he will do. Now, when Jesus gets this revelation, there are four dimensions of revelation we have to talk about here. And the question is, is the initiation coming from above or from below? And I'll unpack that for you in just a moment. So when Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree, the important thing to know is that part of what was going on in that time of the world in Jewish society is if you were somebody who was confidently expecting the Messiah or longing for the coming of the Messiah, the place that you would do that is under a sycamore fig tree. That was like the designated place to go. Some of you would be familiar with the, uh, the lore around Gautama Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. And Buddha uh, famously sat under a bow tree, B-O, a bow tree, um, in uh, central India, and then he later went to Sri Lanka. And so throughout that part of the world, bow trees are sacred. Nobody cuts them down. In fact, they'll plant them if they can. And so when you're in that part of the world, you see bow trees everywhere. This is the same idea. The Buddha sat under a bow tree to find enlightenment. By the way, I'm not preaching Buddhism, just historical checkpoint. Um, the Buddha sat under a bow tree to find enlightenment. Well, if you were a good, pious Jew looking for the Messiah, you sat under a sycamore fig tree. And so when Nathaniel is sitting under the fig tree, uh, that's where Jesus sees him. But let's not forget there was another man that was called by Jesus. His name was Zacchaeus. And where, did, where was he when Jesus called him? In the fig tree. So there's something going on that's a little wider contextually in the Gospel of John that we could easily overlook. But staying under a tree or in the tree is a sign of faith. So what Jesus is saying to Nathanael is, before you were even called by Philip, I had a vision of you under a fig tree, and therefore I know you, Nathanael, to be a man of faith who is authentically seeking the Messiah. And by the way, this is your lucky day. That's what's going on in that passage. Now, when we, when we talk about this revelation, we have to ask, where does the revelation get initiated? Is it revelation from above or from below? 
Well, if it's revelation from above, it comes from above. No man can receive anything except it come to him from above. And so when it's revelation from above, this is the Spirit of God coming down upon you and giving you direct, unmediated revelation. The other way that revelation comes is from below, and this is when something of the earth triggers it within you. Jeremiah, what do you see? I see an almond branch. You have seen well, Jeremiah. I am watching over my word to fulfill it. The revelation is just as valid, but it's triggered by something earthly. It may literally be physical, a literal almond branch that Jeremiah saw. It could be a vision of it, but it's something down here. Does that make sense? So we're, whenever we're talking about how we receive revelation, we're constantly listening for something that comes from above, and we're also watching what goes on below. Just the other day, I sat down with somebody, and he was telling me about his own journey with the Lord, and he said, I've been where I am for 14 years. And as soon as he said it, I said, I, 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 it came right up, but I checked it and held it, and then I gave him the word a, a few minutes later. But what came to me was, oh, you're about to stop serving Laban. Now, that was revelation from below. I didn't walk in with a word from above. It came to me because of something he said to me, and there was something about that 14. I don't know why it hit me that way, but I realized, yeah, well, Jacob served you know, seven years for Leah and seven years for Rachel, and so your years with Laban are about over. And again, I, it came right up, but I held it. I didn't give it, and then uh, maybe it was five minutes later in the conversation, I gave him that, and it just it hit him like a truck bomb. It crushed him in a good way because that's what true prophecy will do. So the above and below, you've got to be watching for that one because some of you have been trained just to see things and make it up. You know, I, I see a cash box. God's about to give you money. Well, if there's no revelation in that, that's not going to get you anywhere. And others of people have been told, don't pay any attention to all that stuff. Just get the pure word from above, brother. And, and that becomes rather, well, ephemeral, and sometimes that's equally invalid. <clears throat> so once the trigger comes, whether from above or below, Revelation occurs in four dimensions. And because it occurs in four dimensions, it's important to understand that the natural and the supernatural don't need to conflict as long as you can and do distinguish the natural from the supernatural. You must distinguish the natural from the supernatural, or at least recognize that something is going on that could be a little bit blurry on the boundary. And the reason you have to be able to do that is if you don't, you'll probably either prophesy beyond the grace that's there for the word you're giving, or you'll miss the word altogether. So it's a double-edged sword. You can miss both ways. This, by the way, is an advanced topic in the prophetic, so if you haven't had a lot of training in this, you're probably like, <laughs> but you should go buy all the materials that I was waving at you, and then you'll come up to speed. Okay, here's the four dimensions. Number one, which gift of the Spirit is in use? Which gift of the Holy Spirit is in use? Number two, what is the mode or gateway of communication? Number three, what's the dimension of time? And number four, what is the realm of space in which it's occurring? Jesus gives Nathaniel three prophetic words, and all of these are in play, and I'm going to show you how it works. I'm going to unpack it for you. And so... When they bring Nathanael over to him, when Philip brings him over, <clears throat> the first one is, here is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile or no deceit. This is John 1.47. So in this one, this is Revelation. The trigger is where? From above. Why? Because he knows the character of the man. But don't forget, he'd also had a vision of Nathanael under the fig tree. Now, that wasn't, a, I don't think, an earthly vision. I mean, I guess he could have seen him across the courtyard. But Nathaniel is so taken aback by this, clearly from the way the passage is uh, unfolding, I don't think Jesus was standing there and Nathaniel saw Jesus and it was like, oh, yeah, hi, over there. I don't think it was one of those. I think it was Nathaniel was, I don't know, two blocks away or something, you know, down the street and around the corner in somebody's yard under the fig tree, maybe his own yard, who knows, but whatever. Um, he's having... He's having a dual supernatural initiation. 
The gift that he uses, at least in this first word, is discerning of spirits. And, you know, when we talk about discerning of spirits, the word spirit in Greek is the same word as for breath or pneuma. And so he's discerning the pneuma or the breath of the man. And so, you know, to kind of extend that metaphor and make a bit of a joke out of it, does he have bad breath or does he have nice minty breath? If he has bad breath, well, then maybe we've got a demonic spirit, right? If he's got nice minty breath, well, maybe it's something from the Lord. And then, of course, there's just the nature of the human spirit. This is how the gift of discerning of spirits operates. So he's operating in this moment with that gift. The mode is through apparently feeling and intuition. He knows something of Nathaniel that he wouldn't have known. It is possible he may have seen something, but there's nothing in the passage that specifically points to that, so I'm a little reluctant to call that one out. I think it's rather that Jesus just intuitively senses the nature of the man. So that's the gift, that's the mode. The dimension is the present tense. It's a now word. Behold an Israelite in whom there is right now no guile, no deceit. It's the same reason that when Peter gets his word that we looked at last night, he can say, ah, flesh and blood didn't reveal this, reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then a moment later, he's like, get behind me, Satan. So the, the, the present tense doesn't mean the continuous tense. And sometimes people want to mistake that too. Well, you know, Ken Fish told me that I was, you know, a man of God. Yeah, in that moment, you were a man of God. <laughs> but when you're out, Going down to the bar and getting drunk, maybe not so good. All right, so what's the dimension of time and what's the realm of space? In this particular case, the realm is the interior. It's the soul or the heart of the man. Second word, uh, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, in this case, this is revelation that has a, has a trigger from below. The trigger from below is because when they start their dialogue, Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And so Jesus now answers that question. It's a trigger from below. It's an earthly, natural exchange. Not unlike when my friend said to me, I've been here 14 years, and I immediately got the word, you're about to leave Laban's service. So in the exchange now, about being under the fig tree, the gift appears to be a word of knowledge. I saw you, and words of knowledge are usually present tense or past tense. They don't usually deal with the future. How did he get it? What was the mode? He was seeing it, just like Isaiah saw that whirlwind. And the dimension was past tense. Before you were here, you were there. I saw you there. So past tense. And the realm, in this case, is not the interior dealing with the heart of the man, but rather the physical realm. <clears throat> so the realm of the physical uh, deals with where you were. You were under the fig tree, sitting there contemplating me, although you didn't know that it was me that you were contemplating. Now, when people have this um, kind of experience, by the way, Understand that the spiritual senses can also be used in the natural realm. There is a, there is a transition or a continuum between the two. And so um, I'm thinking of a friend of mine that lives in another country, and um, she often has these kinds of experiences, like Jesus is describing here. I saw you there before you were here. And on many occasions when I've been with her, people will come in, and Bob Jones used to do this. He'd say, oh, I saw you this morning in a dream, Right? that kind of thing. So this friend of mine, you know, on one occasion went to a seaside town and was seeing the homes and could describe this one's painted gray, that one yellow, that one red, whatever. And, you know, these are the house numbers on them. And, you know, she was, as it were, walking through the town. And then uh, not long after that, she and her husband went to that town. And as they drove in, she said, oh, right, this is that town. The houses are going to be in this order, you know, gray, yellow, red, green, and their house numbers are ba 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 She'd already been there. That's the kind of thing that Jesus is describing here with Philip. But again, if you don't function in the prophetic or these things haven't opened up to you yet, it may sound all a little bit wild, but, but this is exactly what we're talking about. 
All right, the third prophetic word is more of a future-oriented word. It's found in 158. He says, you will see heaven opened. And the thing that initiates this one is, um, is a faith declaration by Nathaniel. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus says to him, you know, because I told you I saw you, you believe that? You're a pushover. You're supposed to be a leader of Israel, and you're, you're a soft sell here. And then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open. So the thing that becomes the initiation point or the trigger point um, is his declaration of faith. Is that about from above or from below? Wow, this concept really sank in, didn't it? It's initiation from below because he's having an encounter with a human being and he's talking to him about something that was from above, but at that moment, as we transition to word number three, he, he makes a statement about Jesus, and that statement about Jesus now gives birth to another layer of revelation. Remember what I was saying about if you accept the one, you'll get the higher revelation? Well, here's what's about to happen. He's, he sees it. Ah, you're the son of God. You're, you're, you're the king of Israel. By the way, note that he says it long before Peter did. Peter does it much later in Jesus' life. Okay, so in that, now, because he understands that truth, that you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel, because he understands that, Jesus gives him a higher word, a higher revelation, or the next layer of revelation, if you want to say it that way. I'm not so hung up on the language, as long as you get the idea of motion. And so now the gift that he's using is prophecy. The mode that he's using is hearing. I tell you, why is he telling him? Well, because Nathaniel has to hear the word. This is what's about to happen to you. The dimension is future tense. You will see. So we've had stuff in the past, we had stuff in the present, we've had stuff in the future. And the realm has to do with the unseen realm. Why is it the unseen realm? Well, you're going to see angels of God that are normally unseen, they're going to become seen to you, and they will ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. Does that make sense? Yes. So how many ways can a word come? And this is why this matters to you, or should matter to you. I'm, I'm trying to give you an understanding of the multiple ways that words can come. So here, let's, let's unpack it. There are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians 12. Most of us could name them. Faith, miracles, healing, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation, tongues, and prophecy. Nine gifts. The book of Romans chapter 12 describes six that are in addition to those, but a couple more that also overlap those. I don't want to double count them, so I've taken out, for example, prophecy. But these other six gifts are gifts like mercy and helps and so forth. So if we add the nine from 1 Corinthians to the six from Romans, we have 15 different gifts. And I'm deliberately leaving out the office gifts of Ephesians 4.11 because they, uh, they, they aren't really charismata. They're constituted gifts that come uh, from the Father for investiture upon the church. They, they have a different function in them. So we have 15 gifts. We have six modes by which words can come. We have three dimensions, past, present, and future, and we have at least three realms that we see here in Jesus' words to Nathaniel, at least three. And, and I would add to that, there may be other realms that you know, we kind of interact with as we, as we speak with people. Uh, could be things under the earth, on the earth, above the earth. But if you just do the math of 15, gifts times six modes times three dimensions times three realms that's 810 different ways or combinations i'm using combinatorial mathematics here but that's 800 and diff 810 different ways that a word can come and then if you have an, if you have uh the trigger point or the initiation from above versus below you can double that so we've got 1620 different ways that words can come from god 1,620 ways. Now, how about you? How many ways do you get words from God? 
Now note that these are all various combinations. But part of what happens to people is they fall into ruts. They fall into, this is the way it always happens for me. This is what it is. And they may not even be realizing that there's revelation coming to them in a way that's, that's not what they even thought about, let alone are tuned to receive. And if they don't have the thing tuned to receive, it's like the radio in your car. Does anyone listen to radio in their car anymore? Okay, so, you know, you got the radio in your car. If you're tuned to, I don't know, 1640 or something, whatever, 1070, that's a big station in Los Angeles on the AM band. If you're listening to 1070, um, but the frequency that's coming in is 940, you won't pick it up. And so we have to expand our capacity and if we don't even know what the capacity is, we don't even know how prophets receive, we would not be receiving very well, would we? You know, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth declares his handiwork. Day to day they pour forth speech, and night to night they pour forth knowledge. There is no voice, there is no language where they are not heard, but we live in a time where our gateways have been polluted and shut and consequently, we are not receiving all that we should be, even though the promise of Scripture is greater revelation than I have received, you will receive, Jim. How about you, Carlene? Greater revelation. You see, so we, we talk about this stuff and we go, man, if only I were Sean Bowles. And I'm like, well, if only we could unplug our gateways, maybe we would be that guy. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, and then something I've talked about before, but I'll revisit it. Now, those of you in my school, this will be a review session for you, but it'll be short. On top of those 1,620 different mechanisms or combinations by which revelation can come to you, there are four additional dimensions of revelation. The first one is clarity. Now, in the seeing realm, this will have to do with precision. So are we talking stick figures or are we talking... Apple just came out with a new computer with a 5K ultra high def monitor. Forget 4K, it's old hat. It's so 2020. So are we seeing it as a stick figure or are we seeing it in 5K ultra high def? If, we're, if it's in the hearing dimension, it's volume. Is it loud versus soft? Remember, Elijah in the cave heard something like a thin whisper or, or a still small voice. And other times, maybe it's far more all encompassing and dramatic. Both are valid. But if you aren't tuned for the one, you'll miss it. Touch, gentle versus firm. If God puts his hand on you, if he touches you, or if you're you know, operating in the spirit and you're you know, sensing things, you know, if you think it has to be as firm as that, well, you might miss it. And so you have to learn to discern because the touch dimension comes into play. If we're on the smelling dimension, sometimes it'll be incredibly intense. Just before I came here, I was in another city, and uh, I was praying with somebody, and there was a smell that came so strongly into the room. I had the person I was praying with and two helpers, and I stopped, and I said, do you guys all smell that? Oh, we don't smell anything. I said, no, no, just breathe it in. No, no, we don't smell anything. I said, no, though, the Lord is like, this is like level eight on a 10 scale. But again, their gateways were closed because they're so unaccustomed to this. Does someone know how to cast that out of Siri? My watch does this from time to time, and I don't know why it does it. I thought there was a switch that you turned off the Siri, but she just comes alive and does all that. Anyway, so the smelling dimension, um, you know, there are times in the Gospels where it says they did not understand because their hearts were hardened or their eyes were closed the disciples struggled with this so don't feel bad if you struggle with it but recognize that it's a thing this is not just a oh that's an interesting little boy you're saying those guys really sucked <laughs> let's go have a hamburger that's not where we're supposed to take away from that so we want to be we want to be aware of what's going on so the smelling uh, can be faint or it can be strong Similarly, taste, faint or strong. And if it's in that interior knowledge dimension, the clarity piece of this, it would be more along the lines of, is it a hunch or is it a certainty? You know, sometimes you just know that you know that you know. And there are other times that you're pretty darn sure, but you're not absolutely sure. And I would say, if you're in that second category, couch your language accordingly. Don't try to be dogmatic about it, because 
if you're in that second category, you're likely to be right, but you're not certain to be right. But if you know that you know that you know, then you know that you know that you know. You say, well, how do I know that I know? If you're asking if you know that you know, you don't know. Because generally people who are in that, in that first one, they, there's no doubt at all. But again, this is the process of prophetic training. And so you can't be dogmatic. There's a church not far from where I live. And um, I heard this horror story about a woman who came in to get some prayer. And uh, so there was a pastor there and this couple that I know and the woman. And they sat down and the pastor immediately goes into her. I know you're in immorality. I know you're in adultery. Admit it. Confess. And she's like, I'm not doing anything. Yes, you are. The Lord shows me I am certain. She bursts into tears, runs out of the church, crying, never comes back. Well, he was in category two, not category one. But he thought he was in category one. So until you know what that thing is, don't pretend that you are. I know it looks cool and it makes you think that you're the new Bob Jones. But believe me, you'd rather do this right and exercise love than try to push this thing beyond the boundaries of your own faith. Because what does the scripture say? If anyone prophesies, let him prophesy how? Somebody said it according to the measure of his faith or her faith. And so your faith may not be where you think it is. So test these things until you become more sure. All right, so that's the clarity dimension. The second one is the vividness dimension. So again, if we're back to the visual side, then we've got black and white versus color. Um, on the hearing side, we've got something that might be plain spoken versus musical. And so sometimes, you know, when God speaks, he'll speak with a musicality to his voice. St. Augustine, the great theologian, writes in the Confessions that one day he was sitting in, in a, a, <clears throat> under a pear tree in his town, hometown of Thagast in North Africa. Today it's modern Tunisia. But anyway, he's sitting there, and he's not yet a believer, but he's, he's striving, he's contending with God because the Lord's after him, and, you know, he's ultimately going to win as he does. And Augustine hasn't yet come to that place of faith, and he's contemplating things, and all of a sudden he hears a child's voice saying, Tola lege, tola lege, which is Latin for take up and read. And he looks, and there lying by him, what do you know, is a scroll from the book of Romans. And so he opens it up, and it, you know, it's talking about, we have had enough of the fruitless deeds of darkness, and so now let us live as children of light, and with that, Augustine was converted. He heard the voice of God musically as a child's voice, but there was no child to hear. See how that works? Plain spoken and musical. All right, sometimes it'll be a little matter of fact versus plaintive versus insistent. Plaintive, by the way, means kind of with a begging or a, you know, an asking tone. So when Elijah goes to the cave... We know what happens in that cave, although maybe we don't remember, so I'll recount it to you. We're in First Kings 18. Elijah's in the cave, and the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. Now, we know it comes as the sound of a thin whisper, so it's not very loud to begin with. But here's the question. Was it matter of fact? What are you doing here, Elijah? Was it plaintive? What are you doing here, Elijah? Or was it insistent? What are you doing here, Elijah? Each of those says something different, doesn't it? And so this is the tonality of God's voice that we have to learn to receive. And most of us have never even thought about all that. And we don't know which of those three it was. I mean, whichever one it was, it got him out of the cave. <laughs> and he went back to work. But I don't know how God handled Elijah in that moment. It could have been any of those. And then there's... Um, then there's What's the level, and this is in, all in the realm of vividness, what is the level if there is some sort of a spiritual force involved? What is the level of resistance? Now, sometimes when you're functioning in these dimensions of the prophetic, there is a kind of a resistance factor that you'll come up against. Paul speaks of this when he says to the Thessalonians, I wanted to come to you again and again, but... Satan hindered us. Now, some of that was undoubtedly earthly, natural phenomena, but Paul seems to be indicating 
that he actually thinks this was demonic opposition that was using those earthly factors, whatever they may have been, storms, ships that broke down, uh, couldn't book passage, uh, sickness, injury, whatever, but all of this was holding us back. And so when we talk about resistance, there can be a full stop such as Paul being unable to get back to Thessalonica, or it may near, merely being a, um, a retarding effect, something that slows you down, what I call wading through mashed potatoes. So we had an example of that one time when I was on a ministry trip in another country, and it was just a hard trip. It just didn't feel good. It wasn't going well. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go home. Um, but I was there, and I called my wife, and I said, you know, I want to come home. And she said, stay down there. God sent you. Don't come home till you're done. Um, and here, here are some examples that might help you associate what I'm talking about with this resistance factor. It is as though there is something there, but to your, at least your five senses, there's nothing there. And yet there is something there, and yet there's nothing there. And so if any of you have ever seen the Star Wars movie called The Phantom Menace, it's the first one in the entire string of whatever we have now. It's getting to be like Freddy Krueger. I don't know, what do we have, 12 versions of Star Wars or something? But anyway, so in that first one, there's a guy called Darth Maul. And we have two Jedi that are chasing Darth Maul. And of course, they're on some starship or something. And Darth Maul is, he's a Sith Lord, and he has a two-edged lightsaber. Anyone remember this movie? Did anyone see this movie? My kids love Star Wars, so I saw this. But anyway, so you've got Obi-Wan, the young Obi-Wan Kenobi. Everybody knows that name. And his Jedi Master, Qui-Gon Jinn. And they're going after Darth Maul. And they're in this spaceship or whatever it is. And as they're going in, all of a sudden this shield comes up, and it's, it, you can see through it, and of course they make you know that there's something there because there's like a squiggly blue wavy thing, and, and they're like these, these metal things that pivot in, and between them there appears to be an open gap, but there actually is something very firm and resistant there. Darth Maul is on one side of it, and Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn are on the other, and they all know that this thing is here, and so at one point Darth Maul, you know, he has his two-edged lightsaber, Thing, and he kind of he hits it and even a lightsaber won't go through that it's whatever that field is it's that powerful it, it'll stop a lightsaber and I don't remember which of the two Jedi does it but it might have been Obi-Wan anyway he takes his blue lightsaber and kind of and he can't get through it so they all turn off their lightsabers and they stand there looking at each other because they can't get through to each other there's no fight to be had at that moment and they kind of, you know, chill out for a moment or two. And pretty soon, the, these things start to separate, and the shield goes down, and all of a sudden, the lightsabers are back on, and the fight's on. Well, that kind of spiritual opposition or resistant force can be a, a very powerful thing. And you've got to be aware of it when you're, when you're getting... Now, I'm talking about prophetic revelation because if that's in place, good luck getting the prophetic revelation. It's like the heavens are brass. You might have heard that term out of the Old Testament. So a lot of this language that we've taken is very uh, symbolic. Well, it's symbolic, but it's more than symbolic. It's actually the way it is. Here's another one that's more uh, current. Uh, nah, maybe 10 years ago, my wife and I were in Hawaii and we'd gone hiking in the hills, and so we came up this trail, you know, doing what we're doing. As we came to the top of the trail, here was a circle of rocks that was laid out, and it was pretty big. It was, it was at least as big as this open area right in here. And along the tops of each rocks were these leaves of uh, trees that had been laid down on top of the rocks, and inside the circle there were offerings of fruit and flowers. This is called a heao. It's, a, it's also known in the Bible as a high place. It's where you worship the spirits and demons of the, of the area. And as we came up the trail, I kind of boom, I bunked into something. I'm like, what is that? And then I kind of looked, and I saw the ring of rocks, and I knew exactly what it was, and I was like, ah. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm on vacation here. I'm not really looking to get in a fight. <laughs> I don't have my lightsaber. So I'm thinking. <laughs> so I just said, 
I'm, I'm here in peace, and I just want to move on. And I kind of skirted the hay out. Um, last week, I was in Utah. And interestingly enough, we were, um, we were not too far out of St. George, which has become a very popular destination. People like to go hiking and whatnot. And so we went on this hike up in the mountains, the people I was with. And as we were going along, I, I'm just kind of, you know, we're hiking and doing what you do when you hike. And all of a sudden, I look up, and I see these little stacks of rocks. They call them cairns. Every one of those is a witchcraft thing. And we came up not just on one or two, but a whole field of them. I mean, there was, I could show you the picture. I took a picture, several pictures of it. And everyone's like, yeah, and they're just cruising through. I'm like, I'm not doing that. No way. So I, I kind of made a big circle around it, saw the perimeter of where this thing was, and I went around it. Now, I didn't feel the force field because I didn't get close enough to it, but I'm willing to bet there was something there, maybe of a lower level, not the kind that would stop you dead in your tracks. But nevertheless, there's something there. And I, and I said to them, you guys shouldn't be going through there. And they're like, why not? And I, it's the shortest way. And I said, yeah, just walk a few more steps to go around this because I guarantee you by tonight you're all going to be sick. You know what happened? Yeah. I didn't word curse them. These are things that you want to be aware of in the realm of the prophetic. And then finally, um, on this vividness scale, there's the pleasant versus the unpleasant. You might remember that Ezekiel was told to eat a scroll. And he said, when I did, it was sweet in the mouth, but then it was bitter in the stomach. That's Ezekiel 3.3. And John had a similar kind of an experience in Revelation 10.10. I haven't figured out if there's any meaning in 3.3 versus 10.10, but anyway, there you go. Both of them had that kind of an experience. And so with it, you'll find that at times the revelation you receive seems really good, and then it's not so good. Or it may seem not so good, but on retrospect, it's actually very good. And so, again, sophisticated prophets learn to discern these things. They, first of all, you have to know that it's even a thing. That's why I'm pointing them out to you. Um, and then they learn how to incorporate all of that into their prophesying. Um, the third dimension here that's of the four supplements is animation. Some things will be still. Some will be motion pictures. I know everybody wants motion pictures because we're all, all used to watching video these days. But sometimes a still picture is just as powerful and it may even be better. I personally actually prefer still pictures to motion ones, but sometimes I get motion pictures. And then, uh, and then there's grayscale. Now this is this is unique to the visionary dimension, but grayscale can go from zero percent. And when we say zero percent grayscale, this is really what you're experiencing right now as you look at me. I mean, in the in the most literal sense of the word, the air in here is not transparent. But for all practical purposes, it is transparent. And so um, as you look at me, you have no obstructions between your eye and what you perceive and you know, me and my whatever this is, blue or teal shirt and my black pants. You have no obstruction there unless you happen to have dirty eyeglasses. Then you might have an obstruction. But I'm not talking about that. That's 0% grayscale. At 100% grayscale, it's entirely opaque. So if I stand behind this painting, you can't see my legs because this is 100% grayscale. So between the zero of the air and the 100% of this, there is 1 to 99. And the higher the grayscale number, the less likely that it will be transparent. When you're seeing something in the spirit, especially if you're starting to do it kind of as a beginner, uh, getting going, the grayscale level may be, unless the Lord's giving you a special grace to encourage you, it may be down around 5%. And at 5%, if you aren't paying attention, you'll think you saw something and then you won't see it. And you'll be like, did I see that? Oh, well. And you kind of blow it off. And so part of what you have to do is when you see something, you need to stop and kind of weigh into it. You've got you to perceive, not merely see. What is that that's really going on there? This, by the way, is what's going on with Moses at the burning bush. He'd probably seen a few burning bushes in his life because they're not, they're not entirely unheard of in desert areas. But they're also not super common. But when you've been 40 years in the wilderness taking care of sheep, you'd have your share of opportunities to see a burning bush now and then. And so he sees the bush, and he could have gone, eh, another burning bush. I've seen 20 of those in my life, or five, or whatever. But... Instead, he goes, huh, what a strange sight, a burning bush, and it's not burned up. I think I will turn aside and see this great sight. And when he does, 
as he draws near, now he goes from seeing to perceiving. Remember, you have to receive this level to receive this level, to receive that level. So he goes from seeing to perceiving, and it says he perceives, he sees the angel of the Lord in the bush, in the flame, and then he, then, third level, he hears Moses Put off your sandals, for the ground upon which you are standing is holy. There's the process of revelation being unfolded for you. But it may have been that the angel he saw in the midst of that flame, I think the flame was probably as near to 100% grayscale as a flame can be, because flames have a kind of a see-through character to them anyway. But I, I, I imagine that that angel probably was not at 100% grayscale. I imagine it was something below that. So he actually had to see it. Oh, and that's how things clicked into place for him. So I, I mentioned these, uh, these four additional dimensions of clarity, vividness, animation, and grayscale because they will play into how you receive. But what I really want you focusing on is the 1,620 combinations by which you can receive revelation that we see coming through Jesus so that you can start prophesying with more effect. Does that make sense? Any questions? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, we won't do any questions. Oh, yeah, Julia. What color is it? It's clear. clear. It's probably an angel. It might be it's probably an angel. Yeah. A lot of times people will see things like that or maybe a streak of light um, when they're starting to perceive angels. You could ask the Lord to slow it down or make it clearer. That might work. It kind of depends on what his purposes are, but that'd be my guess. Yes, sir. Ken. Well, um, it depends on which gateway you're talking about. Of course, most of us could probably stand to have them all roto-rooted a bit. But, um, but you know, think about the kinds of things that I mentioned that could pollute your eye gate, your ear gate, and uh, maybe go back to the Lord with it, uh, get some friends to pray with you about it, and um, put those things in front of him. Lord, I listened to all this really trashy, raspy music. I want to have that cleaned out. Or, Lord, you know, when I was younger, hopefully not now, I was, you know, looking at porn or I was, you know, ogling women or men if you're a woman. Um, or if you've been in a gay thing, you know, I used to ogle men and I'm a man or I used to ogle women and I'm a woman. But, you know, these kinds of things that clog uh, the eyes. You know, here's another one, by the way. Greed is a really powerful one. Um, you might remember the story of uh, Achan from the book of Joshua. They, they go up to battle and uh, they're defeated at Ai. And so they seek the Lord and you know, they draw lots and it turns out that this man named Achan has taken a wedge of gold and uh, two talents of silver and two cloaks from Shinar, which is Babylon. And, but what does he say? He said, when I saw them, I desired them. Boom, that was it, his gateways closed. And so bad was it, in fact, that he violated the command of the Lord bringing death upon the camp and ultimately his own death. So I'm not trying to put bondage on anyone. I'm just saying the scripture gives us language around these things. But again, because we've been taught to read with eyes that are not open, and the very thing that Jesus said, remember I was talking last night about, you know, they're getting in a fight about bread in the boat. And Jesus is like, what is this leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod? There it is right there. So those are the things we need to be consciously sorting through and sifting through in our own minds and hearts and lives and histories 
uh, and asking the Lord to uh, clean all of that out. Yes. Yeah, it is a possibility, and that's actually what we're going to do for our activation tonight. So it's going to be really cool. I, I, I haven't taught this message that many times. It's a pretty new message for me. I've only done it, and it's only been this year that I've done it. Um, but every place I've gone when we've done the activation, every single person in the room started to operate through gateways they don't usually use. And so their prophetic went up just because of this exercise. So it's pretty cool. Did you have a question over here? No? Okay. Yes? Um, there are some people who are addicted to fine fabrics. I, I used to have a colleague who would only buy Armani suits made out of a particular grade of wool, and they started at about $2,000. I got by with like, you know, 600 or $800. I mean, we had a real job. I mean, we were executives. We had to dress the part. But, you know, I got by with suits that were decent quality wool, but they weren't that. And, you know, people who do that, they, they're always after that finest of fabric. And so ermine, I mentioned, is a very, very soft uh, kind of um, fur that a lot of times is used to line collars or hoods, things like that. It's very expensive. Uh, chinchilla is very close to it, which is another very expensive kind of fur. Uh, or, you know, they, they only want the best satin to line their jackets if they're getting, say, custom-made suits. And, you know, these are the things that drive the pricing way up. But there are people who say, well, you know, only the best against my skin. And I think when people try to mollycoddle the flesh... I'm not saying we have to be like flagellants and you know discipline ourselves all the time, but but when we when we live in that realm of luxury all the time, there's something about it that corrupts the soul, because Jesus even said it is hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, and all these things of which we're speaking are things of the kingdom of heaven, and only the rich can afford these creature comforts. So I think we actually do better in terms of learning to operate in the dimensions of God to dial it back a bit. I'm not saying you got to go around in sackcloth and ashes all the time, but, but don't be over there in that ultra premium category continuously because it will in time block the gateways of revelation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you ready to do an activation? Okay. Everybody needs to get with somebody that they didn't come with. And ideally somebody you don't know. But if you know everyone in the room, then just pick someone you didn't come with. Okay, one, two, three, go. No, Heather, you cannot be with Rhonda. No. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> cheater <laughs> all right now, what's that 